I want to do is I'm going to ask one primer question just to get the discussion started. And then, uh, then uh, you can ask questions of the group. Shannon, I want to start with you. I'd like you to ask the group a question. Whoa. All right, so take that mic. Everybody recognize Shannon? Like Never. any question? Any question you like. Go. <laughs> <laughs> what code do each of you um, specialize in? There you go. I'm a Java guy, sorry. <laughs> I work in a Java shop, but I have way more experience with .NET. I used to be a small talk developer and then switched to .NET. Uh, I mean, oh. it's like, it's like, uh, so my native language is uh, C++ when I was a developer, and now when I need something, I use Python. I was a Java developer for a number of years, and now I write crappy Python and hand it off to my engineering team to deal with. <laughs> I probably know Objective-C the best, but write crappy Python the most. And I used to write in basic. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that still exists? Um, yeah. OK. <laughs> Questions? So please. You, you can come up, you can line up here. There's chairs to sit while you're waiting for the mic if you want to come up and ask a question. Uh, so what do you think, what kind of scans are needed as part of a um, security build pipeline, like a non-invasive and production uh, build uh, deep scan? So I think that was, you want to take that? You want your own to take it? Because I think it's your own. <laughs> um, so uh, I think you'll, in the end, need to full stack, which means uh, you start with the shift left approach, having static analysis first, both on uh, the, infra the code of your infrastructure, uh, your operating systems, the libraries and stuff like that. Um, and then obviously have dynamic scans uh, on top of that to verify whether you missed something. So um, Nessus isn't dead at all. Um, and from there onward, have your dynamic analysis on, uh, on your uh, applications. That's at least the basics you'll need. And depending on uh, what type of applications you're creating, you might need runtime fizzers as well for specific functions within your application. It all highly depends on what you're doing there. But then again, it all depends on the value you're trying to defend. That's one thing I have to add there. You know, that's the answer to every one of these questions is going to be, it depends. We're going to use that as a buzzword bingo. Uh, I believe we have to remember that it's 2017. And it's not enough just to use traditional static analysis and traditional dynamic analysis. Thanks to market innovators, there are new technologies that already come to the market. In particular, there are specific, specially designed developer static analysis that would enable you to test your tiniest snippets of the code in within a few seconds. And then there is a team-oriented static analysis that would let you to test very quickly your builds. Now, when it comes to dynamic analysis, to test, please realize that it's not one anymore, a runtime testing analysis. Not only test, there is IS there as well. And I would expect that adoption of, in a reasonable time, adoption of IS will exceed adoption of test, especially that IS being instrumented agent uh, will have deep insight into application behavior. And then there is a RASP for runtime application cell protection. Plus, I believe we've not mentioned beautiful technology called SCA, the software composition analysis. It's not a scan per se, although it's a scan for detecting third party components. So the full spectrum will be developer static analysis, team static analysis, full static analysis, software composition analysis, interactive application security testing, and then runtime application cell protection. Okay, great, thank you. Anybody else? Because I've got, if nobody else has, do you want to say something? Okay, one. Oh. So our approach is a little bit more rugged, perhaps. Um, we sort of hunt your bad decisions. So architecture-wise, go after your bad decisions. 
Um, look at things in your code repositories, like your secrets that might be hiding, using things like GitRob. We harness all that information against the kill chain. And um, as part of making it so that we really get to the root of what something might, somebody might compromise, we try to make that so that it's part of a full kill chain. So we're really hunting exploits. And that process and that pipeline um, then attaches to the CICD in the right way, making it so that your effort about what you're trying to close out is not just hygiene related, but actually the biggest part of your attack surface and the stuff that you really need to fix sooner than later. So, Nigel, I found your talk earlier really interesting and sort of the, the talk about language and how arguments, it's the same kind of terminology as war. I, I find I'd never considered that before and I found that interesting and I, in all the cultures, like it's conceived as more of a dance. Do you see a way to change that currently for ourselves in terms of making like an argument more of a collaborative thing instead of shouting at each other or are we kind of stuck with that now that it's so embedded or it would take a long time? Thank you. Um, I'd say probably not. I think that's pretty baked into how we generally approach conflict and confrontation. Uh, I'd say that we probably need to just sort of conceive of things as not an argument. I think in a similar way to a big thing that's been in operations, the security of sort of going through no blame postmortems and retrospectives. Like you've, you've got to just change the terminology to get people to actually behave differently. And one of the things I really liked about no blame postmortems is how quickly it took off. Um, as a, I don't know how many of you have been in postmortems that are the opposite of a no-blame postmortem. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people went, that's the problem, let's just address it straight on, let's pick a different label for it. Okay. I saw somebody else come up first. Well, I wouldn't mind, like, a really, I think an associated one to follow on to that question would be, what, what's the terminology for, given, as the resident non-security person on the panel, what's the terminology you'd love to see dropped from the security space. Yeah, one phrase you'd like to see drop, yeah. one word or phrase, go again. I would, fix. Yeah, no, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a security guy, I would love to see the word cyber <laughs> eliminated, but, but as a security guy that actually likes to have an impact outside of the security space, yeah. I think cyber is actually a, a pretty useful word because it makes people think they know what you're talking about, so. <laughs> Uh, I would like the approach oh, to understand what this technical term really means. Let's get out your basic English dictionary and go back to the roots. Guys, things mean what we as a technical community agreed they mean. Going back to Chaucer and Shakespeare doesn't help us to clarify technical terms. I'm sorry, it just annoys me every time I see it. Well. I don't believe that we can drop anything, although I believe that DevOps sounds horrible. <laughs> DevSecOps is even more horrible, but we have practically no choice. You know, we, we love contrarians in the community, Joseph. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I would love to see, I, I don't know if it's a word, but just um, like, oh, that's the security jobs team, that's the developers team. Like, we use this tool, you guys don't use this tool, this is our tool. Like, I was told you can't use Eclipse. I was like, why? Well, I want to look at some code. And they're like, you should use your stack analysis tool. I'm like, but I want to look at what the developers see. I want my eyes to see what their eyes see. And so if we could, like, that's their responsibility or our, like, kind of have some gray there. One word that's been overrated in the Dutch market, at least, is the word, uh, acronym APT. Um, everything is an APT nowadays. There's dark things everywhere. Oh my goodness, you security people are so necessary. I think we should stop having the fear around that and maybe get to grips to what's really happening again. So I've got so many words on my mind. <laughs> it's hard to pick like one. Um, perhaps, um, I, perhaps it's static. I think everything nowadays is dynamic. We're starting to get to a point where things are moving faster. And uh, it used to be that we had checklists and whatnot and that we could actually check things and believe that they were safe or somehow convince ourselves. Um, but really that, that process doesn't work. And I think that we really have to get adversary inclined really understanding that there is a bad guy out there, figuring out how to get ahead of the bad guys is I think what the job of somebody who's doing security has to figure out, and then ultimately making it easier for development teams to um, make it so that they can actually build security into their products without as much friction. 
Great, thank you. We're, we're gonna run really short on time. We got about nine minutes. So when the questions come, we're right to the point where we can do it. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, come on. Um, if you have a specific person you'd like to address to it, please call their name first. Okay. Uh, this is a general question. Okay. So um, for small startups that have around uh, four people where we're just starting and we have almost no security, just had a product and we just got some funding, we need to start thinking about security to build the product into the next level. What are the few top priorities that we need to think about from a DevOps security point of view? <laughs> Can I first of all plug threat modeling? Before you started building, you do need to think on design aspects because it's almost impossible or completely exp too expensive to be possible to fix later. So that should be the first thing you should start looking at, in my opinion. I would say developer security training. If you have a bunch of developers, that are awesome developers, but they don't understand the security aspect, then how can they build you? If you don't have a big security team to help guide them, teach them. Yeah, sure, I got one. Um, so you're a small company, you're gonna make mistakes, get the most critical mistakes, go after something that might capture your DNS and your outbound IPs so that you're not getting CNC takeover of your environment first. Um, you're going to learn from that because it's going to give you a whole bunch of instrumentation about where you've made mistakes. It's going to be a great opportunity for you get, to get educated about how to eradicate those mistakes. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. And one, one thing I'll note, just having participated in startups, from a pure risk management standpoint, like you're way more likely to get killed by your competitors or by customer indifference. Uh, and so you need to measure the amount, not to, not to say not to do security, but you need to weigh security versus the other very w real existential risks that, that, a, that a startup has. So. Um, uh, I want to start with a word of encouragement. Uh, per Gartner assessment, 98% of startups fail. So <laughs> just get ready. Uh, number two, uh, typically uh, startups are being founded by CTOs or people with that title. And at some point in time, you hand it over to a CEO who you are bringing typically from the outside. Be very careful. Don't rush. And the third one, let's say you are in this 2% of those who are going to succeed. Make a plan today. Are you going to try to become a $50 million company that will be acquired within three years with the products that are not done to the perfection? Or you're going to spend 10 years and reach out to maybe $150 million and then, then it's not clear. Make these decisions. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. I've got time for one more. So did you walk up? I saw somebody. If not, I've got a quick Can, question. I saw you coming. I have a question, too. Oh, did you, what's that? I, I have a question, too. You have a question? Yeah, if you... Let, it, let's go with him first, yeah, and then we have time. We'll look him. back. Go ahead. Uh, I want to ask if there are specific tips about DAS for mobile application, because mobile application is a bit more complicated uh, than web application, usually, and we have a lot and a lot more mobile application. Okay. Anybody deal with mobile? So, f uh, Dust, Yast, uh, Sust is the same as uh, in a web. So, so Sust is not special, only Dust and Yast is uh, different. Our colleagues um, in, within OWASP are working on the MobSF project. That's looking very promising, and I would say to use that at least for Android. In iOS, your Dust is going to be hard because there's needles and some other stuff, but it's not as quite sophisticated as. Uh, we might want it to be in the future, but it might change. Uh, but it gives you a starting point. And of course, for your SOS, you can use this ex existing tooling, depending on whether your developer is all into the new Swift thing every new day or stabilizes first. Yeah, thank you. If I understood your question correctly, you're looking for ways to analyze applications to do security analysis. Uh, I published three years ago a research note, you can find it, about application security testing. Here's the summary. Number one, you start with static application security testing. You analyze the code. Better if you analyze not source, but byte and binary code because it's more prevalent. The second type of testing, it's quite atypical. I called it behavioral analysis. 
typically you would place your applications in a simulator and you attach virtual, of course, uh, connectors to it and you would run it and you will watch what application is doing in the background while in foreground it is doing what it declared to do. And you'll find that while, for example, your application is playing music as it's supposed to do, at the same time it retrieves data from your so whatever repository it sends ships to some IP address way outside. So static analysis, then behavioral analysis, then dynamic analysis of a kind of a different kind. You need to figure out the communication between your application and with a hosting application. Because see, if you are failed with your own app, that's okay. But if your app becomes the interface into the uh, global database that sits on your enterprises, that's a serious problem. So you have to test these things. Uh, it's number three. Number four, ideally, you have to be able to provide uh, analysis of s applications that are uh, people downloading from uh, uh, different uh, Apple stores, for example. They don't know. There are hundreds of different of similar apps, and you don't know which of them secure. So it would be nice if you prepare a catalog, scan them up front, and tell people that are buying this application that this one is a great business application with a very poor security score. That's number four. Number five, I believe it was integration with a technology such as MDM and EMM. And the fifth one I've forgotten. Okay. But you can find that research note. Okay. Thank you. We're going to have to call it. And I have got two minutes left. That's got to be really it's short. The shortest ever. If you're going to give one sentence of security advice, what would it be? Mine is if you're the security team and you are not speaking to your developers yet, please go visit them all the time. Keep re-educating yourself and the people around you. Break into your code as much as possible. <laughs> Cross-functional teams. Hmm. I think I'd have to say, uh, don't be the department of no. You've gotta, got to find solutions. Okay. My one sentence would be, don't panic. We we heard lots of scary things in these two days. We can't defend perfectly from everything, but probably we can raise the bar enough to make it really, really difficult. DevOps and DevSecOps are very young, and yet they're surrounded with enormous number of myths that are counterproductive. I would recommend you to be very critical about what you hear about DevOps and DevSecOps dispel this myth. And mine would be that I'm very appreciative for you guys coming. Thank you so much. Please welcome to speak.